Honey, you gotta get up. We have to go. Where are we going? You say while rubbing the sleep out of your eye. All you remember is how much your parents were so eager for you guys to get out the house. It's humid outside in Los Angeles, and all you want to do is sleep and play inside with your brother Bailey. Instead of answering your question, she simply just shushes you and guides you and your brother out the door with suitcases in hand. Even at the age of three, you are old enough to realize that something wasn't right. Your dad grabs you and your brother's hands and slaps a yellow tag on your bare wrist. Ouch! You scream. His grip was way too tight, and the yellow tag was so uncomfortable. With a lot of walking and unanswered questions, you are standing in front of a train station. They sit you down in a seat and put the luggage up overhead. Then they just simply leave. This scary realization hits you. You and your brother are alone with mere strangers on a train and you have no idea where you're headed. Mama, your older brother Bailey screams. Then he starts to cry as she and your father walk out the train car without saying a word or looking back. People give you guys strange looks as you cry and hold each other on the noisy, scary train. A million thoughts circle your mind. Why did they leave us? Why did they leave me? But then your brother finally reads the scribbled writing on the yellow tag around your bare wrist. It says, this child should be delivered to Miss Annie Henderson in Stamps, Arkansas. At least you finally have some idea of where you're going, your grandmother's house. Instead of focusing on your parents who neglected you and your brother, you filled your head with books and a new world full of imagination through stories. To deal with the pain of being separated you declared your mother dead to you and eventually learned to appreciate the little town stamps. Grandma was mama and she taught you how to read and to learn how to put everything in your brain. Mama was a strong, tall woman who didn't let anyone take her pride, even in the South where racism prevailed. Girl, I got great news for you. What, mama? What? You exclaim with excitement. You're going to start living with your actual mama. Life in St. Louis was loud and vibrant with music, art, and dance. You remember your mom turning on the record player while putting on red lipstick and furs to dance to jazz music. Grandma would never do that. So it was like entering a new world. After a while, your mother's loud lifestyle didn't sit right with you. You were so used to life with grandma and the quiet town stamps and not used to all the parties and crowds of people in St. Louis, especially with your mother's many boyfriends who came and went with her pleasing. One was so intoxicated with your beautiful mother that he wanted to control her, and when he couldn't, he decided to lash out in his anger, and so he raped you. You were only seven at the time. You remember that day, all alone, curled up in a ball, scared, not sure who to tell, along with trying to figure out what exactly happened to you. Sis, what's wrong? Your brother Bailey looks at you with concern. He can tell when you're lying or upset, so it was best just to tell the truth. He, you begin, but no words will come out your mouth, and you begin to cry. Eventually, you're able to tell him what happened. Tell me his name. Bailey demands. At first you hesitate because the man said if you said anything that he would kill your brother. But Bailey assured you that he wouldn't let that happen. The man was later put in jail for one night, then released the next day. But then a few days later, the police came to report to your family that he was murdered and it appeared that he was kicked to death. According to your seven-year-old logic, you declared that your voice had killed the man so you stopped speaking for five years. You clamped your teeth shut. You told it in. To you, if you ever talk to anyone else, that person might die too. You had to stop talking. Instead of talking, you absorbed all the things around you. To you, your whole body was an ear. Eventually, you found your voice back through poetry and writing. Through the years of not talking, you managed to read all the books in the black school library. 
and all the white books you could get your hands on. You remember grandma telling you that she knew that you were destined for greatness and you would always find your voice. Even when your mother just believed that you were just simply ignorant. There was this lady, Mrs. Flowers, who introduced you to poetry. You remember that she would treat you to milk and cookies while she read you all different types of poetry. Even though you didn't speak at the time, those were some of the greatest memories you had in stamps. One day, Miss Flowers stopped reading her poetry abruptly and said, You truly don't like poetry, so there's no point in reading it to you. He scribbled on your writing tablet. I love poetry, but she kept insisting that you hated it. Then she said, the only way to truly love poetry is if you speak it through your own lips. At first you thought she must be crazy. Didn't she know that your voice killed people? But you needed to find out for sure. So the next day, you went to the barn, snuck behind the chickens with a poetry book in hand, and read till your heart's content. You had finally found your voice. Even though life in St. Louis will always be a troubling memory, the one thing you learned that made you truly happy beside poetry was dance. In dance, you could express any emotion you had, whether it be happy or sad. You could always make it into something beautiful. Dance was a place where you were truly yourself. So that's what you set out to be, a dancer. Even as a single mom at age 17, you didn't let that get a hold of your dreams. So you started dancing at nightclubs for money to support you and your son. Then you saved up any extra money you had to get dance lessons so you could do more of the talent you already possess. With the dancing career starting, your fellow performers suggested that you start singing as well because you had a decent vocal range. Even though not completely vocally trained, you managed to make your way to fame. The only thing left was to change your name to make you stand out. What's your name, girl? Someone called out in the crowd to you. You started to say your actual name, but then you realized that you needed a name to make you unique. Oh, um, you started to chuckle. The name's Maya. The name Maya seemed most fitting because it was a nickname your brother used to call you when he couldn't pronounce your name. Also, because Maya means illusion. To you, that means that people may think they know who you are based of how you look or how you act, but really there's just so much more to you. Soon people really started to notice you and contracts and companies were coming your way. Starting with Purple Onion, then offers to join a theater company, then you starred in many Broadway musicals and movies like Callisto. These opportunities led you to travel around the United States and even go to the countries where you explored the wonders of their societies, where African Americans were free of segregation and racism that polluted America at the time. The only thing that was missing in your life was the quality time with you and your son. You didn't want to be like your parents who neglected you at a young age. So you ended your travels and went back to the U.S., making sure if you did take on any side gigs, to take your son with you so you wouldn't miss out and be in a big role in his life. Even though you were a singer, dancer, and actor, there was still a dream that always called to you, writing. You loved to read and write when life was tough. And stamps, you filled your head with stories and imagination, and those stories never left your mind. You were busy taking care of your son while doing side gigs. You started to write small scripts and a lot of poetry. Soon, you really began to love it, and you moved to New York to join the Harlem Writers Guild. Here, you got constructive criticism from other African-American writers and made long-time friendships. There, you learned different types of poetry and how to write professionally and get your writing out there. Through different friends and writing, you met different people like Martin Luther King Jr. 
and soon you became invested in fighting for civil rights. You also started telling the stories of your childhood. That's when Bob Lewis kept calling you to write a book. At first, you kept denying the offers because you always thought you were just a poet, but you finally said yes. Then you were able to write a whole new genre the world was not used to at the time. In your books, you had no boundaries. You wrote about all your hardships of your childhood, and you didn't sugarcoat anything. That shook the world. The book, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, told a story that readers weren't used to. You said you wish someone older told you about their childhood and all the things they struggled with so you wouldn't make the same mistakes they did. You always wanted to be the light for the youth so we would have a better society. Your poems and books were so good that Bill Clinton asked you to write a poem for his inauguration. This was the first time a poem took place instead of a speech and it had the whole world talking. From there, many more opportunities came your way. Colleges and universities wanted you to speak to their graduates, even though you never attended college. They called you doctor. Acting jobs called your name. Film crews wanted to share your story through movies. Many books were published in your name. You were even awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Barack Obama. In your life, you never gave up on your dreams and held a legacy for many young people today.